let's get started. We, uh, Am I in the way, Jim? No, you're good. What's that noise? Bridge. Oh, wow. No, 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 don't, you don't have to plug it. It's good. Do it. Oh, do you? Yeah. Do you mind? Yeah. Just because it's a little louder. A little louder. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, a lot to cover, and, and, and uh, we want to be as close to time as possible, so we've got a, shorter, a little bit shorter amount of time. But before we go into our conversation today, let's talk about the last three weeks. Just the last three weeks. So tell me something that you took or took away from or thought about in the last three weeks. So the last three weeks we talked about being an agent of change, being able to build those trusting relationships with people, to expand your sphere of influence. We talked about sending out that survey, right? Did you send out that survey? What did people, what feedback did you get? So, or your style and how that style then impacted when you went back to your workplace or where you hung out or whatever. So a lot of things went on in the last three weeks. So somebody tell me something you took away from the last three weeks. I'm going to get a couple bottles of water here. Okay? Somebody, what did you take away from the last three weeks? Don't everybody yell out at once. It's very good. Mentorship. Okay. What do you mean? Okay, very good. Somebody else, something you took away from last three weeks. What did you take away from last three weeks? What was the... the values of our communication. Okay, and how people communicate. Yep. You should be able to, whether it's in the community, whether it's in the workplace, neighborhood, whatever. You now have a couple of tools to evaluate. Like, let's say in your case, if you sat down with your people, you should be able to assess, huh, how do I communicate? How do they communicate? What's their leadership approach? What's mine or work style? And how can I align mine with theirs? There should be operational efficiencies that come from that. There should be increased bottom line that comes from that. Because just by all of us understanding how each other works, we should be able to gain some alignment. If we're unable to gain alignment, it's either because the leaders haven't instilled the importance of this exercise or the leader is not willing to bend. Because in the past, the assumption was that the leader, that the followers would bend to the leader's style. And you, it usually sounds something like this. Well, what mood is the boss in today? And then we'd all kind of bend and move and roll to whatever the boss, or whoever the person in charge was, if it wasn't a work situation. Or whoever the most influential person was in the room. You guys have all seen that. We've been in a community event, the most influential person in the room, we all kind of bend our style to whoever the most influential person is in the room. But more and more and more, as society has shifted, we are less accepting of that. Now we're like, I don't care who the most influential person in the room, I'll act however I want to act. And we see that attitude more and more, especially in the workplace. Employees saying, I don't care what you say. I'm do is that how she is? He pointed at you. Um, <laughs> employees saying, you know what? You're lucky to have me. You're lucky to have me working here. And because you're lucky to have me, I'll act however I want. How many of you have ever seen that? And whether you see that verbally, they say that, which is rare, or you just see that in their attitude and the roll of the eye and the flip of the hair or the shake of the head. That's how people are. So we're going to get a lot more done today if we're willing to adjust our style to meet someone else's. All right, anybody else? Something that you learned or something that you took away. So you had some tools, in other words, that you should be able to evaluate the people around you and they should be able to evaluate you. Anybody send out that survey? Yeah? Okay. Anybody willing to share the feedback they got? So you sent out the survey. What kind of feedback did you get? Mm. 
Okay, very good. And did you think, so there was some consistency in the feedback? And did you think the feedback was valid? And do you think that the feedback is something that you'll take and do something with now? Because here's the dilemma for all of you in the room. On Monday, things get really, really serious. And what's that? Because on Monday, in Monday morning's email, you're going to be asked to make a commitment. Because now we come, we've been talking about it for six weeks. There will come a time where, hey, we're going to ask you to pick out one thing and get better at it. But look at the sequence. The sequence was you did some introspective work in that leadership history survey. You looked within yourself. And then we did more introspective work with that leadership style inventory. So you had enough introspection looking at yourself. Then you sent out a note to everybody and said, hey, what am I doing right? What could I get better at? All of that combined should give you a pretty good evaluation of yourself. And in addition to that, as you mentioned last time we were together, I asked you to write down three names whose lives would be better if you picked out one thing. Well, Monday morning, the time will come to pick out one thing. Now, you don't have to do it necessarily on Monday, but sometime in the next seven to 10 days, you need to pick out the thing you're going to get better at and then focus on for the balance of the nine weeks that we're going to be together. It's a waste of all of our time, including mine, if you're not better at something, right? And so you need to pick that thing you're going to be better at. Now, in that email, you'll see a link. You click it. You're going to put your one thing. You're going to put your action plan or your steps that you're going to take the support that you may need, the problems you may face, and you'll click send. And a copy will come to me and a copy will go back to you. And then that's the accountability. Now, if you choose to have other accountability, you choose to share that with your family or friends or coworkers, that's up to you. Choose to share that with your employees or direct reports, that's up to you. But at minimum, me and you. Now, no one else is going to see it on my end. None of the employees, none of RMWB, None of my employees, nobody's going to see it on my end. If you choose to share it with somebody on your end, that's up to you. But theory starts to really quickly move into practicality. <coughs> if by the next coaching session you haven't sent in one thing, I'm probably going to send you a note. Hey, what's up? A gentle nudge, if you will. Where's your one thing? So, you know, this is about that time where we've kind of now started to doing this, we're getting used to doing it, but now let's get serious about doing it. So you, you, know, you got a couple weeks to kind of get into the flow of the routine of it, now let's get serious. So on Monday morning, we'll send that out. But you've, you should have had enough introspection and enough exercises and enough dialogue and now sending out that survey, she knows what her one thing should be, pretty clearly. They've told you, you validated it, Probably would make everybody around you a little bit better if you were able to do it. Make yourself a little bit better. So it's a pretty self-evident one thing. Now maybe there's something that's more important or overriding in that. Bless you. Anybody else send out the survey? And what did you take? What did you get from it? Um, not really any surprises. Except my daughter. I, I sent them up to, I asked my family to do it. I asked the guys in the team or in our management team to do it, and I asked my family to do it. Okay. And I asked some community members that I deal with to do it. So to get kind of a, hopefully a bit of a spectrum. And what trends did you see? Or did the trend, you don't have to tell us what the trends were, but did the trends that you saw validate what you thought? Um, or was there some surprises? Really? Yeah, she, uh, she, she hit me pretty hard with the one thing. Really? Yeah. yeah. She said, I was doing something and I, I was doing something and she walked up to me and I was already doing something and she said, uh, she said, I said, just hang on a second, I want, I want to listen to you. And she said, uh, yeah, you never do that. I said, what? I said, she said, I said, I'll, let's put them, you know, and then she said, I'll put that on your, on your, on your. Evaluation? <laughs> well, hi, how are you? Come on in. This is Clayton. Hi, Clayton. How are you, my friend? One of the foremen. He's signing up. He just yeah. Said, no problems. Let's get, uh, there's a chair probably right around the corner. Yeah, we've got some handouts. And we got a handout right here for you. Perfect. Yeah, next time we'll get you, get you to a toonie, man. Yeah. We'll get you a toonie. Um, and so what, okay, so you take from that what? 
Is she right? Oh, yeah. You know what? A nine-year-old is always right. Oh, yeah. So I just, I mean, that's, but it, I took that one personally. Yeah. The other stuff I took was, you know, was not stuff that it was like out of left field, but, and so I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm always, I always, I always purport to be about family, and so that one, that one hurt. Yeah. So it's good. I mean, that's, that's what this is about. It's not about, it's not about going through the whole thing and going, well, that was entirely comfortable the whole time. Right. It was about, boy, that one sucks, so I better do something. That's right. And I think, first of all, all of you, I think, would agree with me. How old are you? Uh, 43, 42. So, so for, a, for a man in his 40s to sit in front of a group like you, expose himself the way he just did, and openly admit he needs to get better at something, how many would say that's unique in and of itself? And then secondly, a person in the position of authority that's in general manager, title, right? So head of an organization to do that is even more unique. And so I think all of us would agree, you just showed leadership. That's leadership, right? Look in myself, get some feedback. That doesn't work anymore for me, I'm gonna change it. That's leadership. Very, very good leadership. Welcome, sir, to you. But we're all gonna introduce ourselves real quick because we don't know you, so your name again? Clayton. Clayton, and you're a foreman yep. for CP Services? And how long you worked there? Long time? Awesome. He runs one of our, like, we have a pipeline division, he runs that division. Awesome. Thanks for being here. He's a local guy for this one. Oh, wonderful. Introduce yourself, sir. He's black, he's just working. Yeah, I'm black. Travel the wall, CP Services. Sorry for returning to Canada. My name's Rock. No, I work for the municipality in Sacramento, which is like. Do you know her? Yeah. And you know him? Yeah. Okay. I'm Ian yeah, that's Ian Hill. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and my name is Ian. And so we welcome. Thank you for getting here, being here. We'll get you. I think you already have a username and password, or not yet? We're, I mean, not yet, no. There's we'll get it. I saw that. And I saw an email from somebody. I saw an email from somebody who's, who was getting all the new people that signed up, getting their emails because she had used their email, her email to sign them all up, Brittany. So I saw that. We'll get it worked out. No worries. We'll get, you, we'll get you all set. So you got feedback. It's clear to you. Is there anybody that got feedback that wasn't as clear as the two of them? Me. Okay. Because she, one of it was, what she liked about me was I didn't give up. Mm. And at times that I felt like giving up, there were times that she's seen me want to give up, that I said I give up, but she knows within her heart that I don't give up. Mm. I asked what I was doing wrong, there was a big question mark on it. Mm. So with the other person that I surveyed was Keith, because he is my husband, yet he is a wor youth worker here as well. So what, I'm, what was I doing right? I got a little bit of, I just like you for who you are. Mm. For I took that in both ways. And then when I got, when it came to what was I doing wrong, nobody is ever wrong in what they do. So I was like, I never got a solid answer. Mm. But it challenged myself is what are my next steps? It's kind of, I got to figure out what I'm doing wrong so that maybe that I need to present it to them so that they see it, that we can work together on it as mm -hmm. a family and as with two youth workers that bring in a child into the center as mm -hmm. well. Like it's two different worlds trying to collaborate. Mm -hmm. so it's really challenging on that one. So one of the, first of all, thank you for sharing that. We're not, and, and one of the things you might thoughtfully consider is who are some other stakeholders who aren't so closely aligned to you? Because it's difficult for your coworker slash husband, yes. right? That's a that's unique. Why I did 
That's a, that's a unique dynamic, right? It's a little challenging for him, as any husband in the room would probably say, uh, to give you feedback all the time. But you may get feedback from other people that you know in the community or other stakeholders that you interface with and that you interact with, right? Yes. So you, who, you might want to think about who are those people? Could it be Onsley people? Could it be, I don't know, the people in the building over there? You know? And then, and then give them out anonymously. Yeah. Yeah, I give them out to myself. Yeah. You got to give them out anonymously. Okay. To give them a chance to be able to speak their mind freely. Yeah. Right? Well, I just put very truthfully pleased. Yeah, but that <laughs> There's a big difference between <laughs> very truthfully pleased Keith. And Keith says, sure, honey, I'll be happy to <laughs> very truthfully please tell you. I would, like, I would like to have supper tonight, but yes, let me very truthfully please tell you. That doesn't mean he didn't give you honest feedback. That just means you want, you want it untethered, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Just send it out to people you, again. I would do it again. Because you said in your own, you just said it. I want somebody to give me insight in how I can get better or what exactly I need to get better at. So if you sincerely want that, then you need to write it down, write those three questions down, print them off, 10 of them, hand them out around town, give them a place that you want them to give it back to you at, hey, drop it off in a box, put it in the mail, whatever you want them to do, and give them a time frame, get, do that in the next 10 days, thank you so very much. You'll give out 10, you'll get four back, you'll now get some insight, right? Mm -hmm. And think, and I would also, th and this is for everybody, think in terms of not just if you have direct reports or if you have peers, but peop other organizations that you might interface with. Like for your company, a great exercise is just doing it regularly with everybody you deal with, whether it's vendors or clients, either one. Or to a vendor, are we easy to deal with? To a client, are you happy? Whatever, right? And the same on the governmental side, and we've talked about this, you know, it, the governmental side oftentimes is the least receptive to feedback. There's an old expression, feedback is the breakfast of champions. And he would be able to tell you that in his professional back, back in the day when he was a professional athlete, hours a week are spent on watching film, game film, practice film. Today's day and age, the professional athlete watches or their coaches watch hours upon hours upon hours of film. Why? To be able to coach the athlete or performance manage the athlete to ensure that the athlete is the best performer they can possibly be. Well, there's game film being shot on us every day. Every person that we interface with is taking film of how we perform. And we can either be afraid of watching that film or we can do what you did. Ask our daughter, let me see that film you've been taking of me lately. And then it gets played up on the screen and there's an old expression in athletics, the big, the, the eye in the sky doesn't lie, which means the film never lies. And so your daughter gave you unfiltered film of your daily performance in the home, unfiltered, because the film doesn't lie. The people you work with gave you unfiltered film of your daily performance. And any of those surveys were unfiltered, hopefully, film of your daily performance. A champion athlete takes the film, isn't offended, makes the corrections, and moves on to the championship. A subpar athlete grumbles about how it's the coach's fault, grumbles about how his, his teammate's fault, grumbles about how the, the, the dirt was soft and that's why they slipped, grumbles about the training regime, grumbles about all the reasons why the film turned out the way it did but doesn't say, I need to get better. So I would strongly encourage you, if you really want to be highly successful, one of the key ingredients to today's highly successful leader is they're proactive in seeking feedback. They continually seek feedback. On a regular basis, they seek feedback. And not just because it helps them get better, but because, and remember we talked about this, and this is so vital, because every other institution that the people they interact with gives them a chance to give feedback. You just got back from Banff, right? 
You could go to TripAdvisor right now and tell the world what you thought of your experience by putting in stars or happy faces or whatever. We're all used to being able to rate our experience. And then they come to work and they don't get to rate their experience. They don't get to give their feedback. They don't get to tell the boss what they think. You're going to have more interest and more excitement amongst your team if you let them do what they do everywhere else in their life, give their feedback. Oh, they don't need to give their feedback. They need to shut their mouth and get their big butts to work. I agree with you. Look, I'm a hard-nosed boss, but I also know that times have changed. So I'm going to get to the same place as the hard-nosed boss. I'm just going to get more of my people as I get there. I'll let them give me some feedback because I'm going to grow and they're going to feel more engaged and they're going to feel more bought into the organization. So those 30 kids you're working with, you need to regularly let them give input on your performance as youth workers. Yeah, but they're a bunch of you know, snotty-nosed kids. What do they know? Hey, they can go on YouTube and give their opinion. They can go on Facebook and give their opinion. They, all the other institutions that serve them, they can give their opinion. If you really want them to give their all, you better let them give their opinion. And the same is true for employees. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And as dads, and then I'm just going to sound a little misogynistic only about men, but to the dads in the room, if we want to make sure our daughters aren't reaching out to some other man down the road, then we better give them a listening ear. And we better give them a lap to sit on all the time. And we better give them a, a, a kind heart. Otherwise, they're going to go seek that male approval from somebody else. And it's probably going to be somebody else that we don't want. How many of you agree with that? And it all boils down to her being nine. Just like my little Nadia, nine years old, basically told me the same thing. That, hey, man, you don't listen to me. So all of us can take and learn from this, hopefully. And hopefully this will be a regular exercise for you. For me, when I had 1,100 employees, every employee got to evaluate my performance twice a year, my direct reports every 90 days. Every 90 days, they got to tell me what they thought. Every 90 days. And I used it as a gauge. And the gauge I said was, okay, you told me I wasn't so hot. I'm going to work on it for 90 days. What kind of feedback do I get now? Hey, you've gotten better at that. Cool. I know I'm building the trust bank account with my people. Hey, you haven't gotten better at that. I'm not building the trust bank account with my people. So by doing it regularly, I get to see my improvement. Now it gives me a focus on a whole nother note, totally off topic, that we'll talk about at the end. That little exercise keeps me, me engaged. I'm working on listening for the next 90 days. Send out the survey. Hey, everybody said I got better at listening. Cool. Now all of a sudden life's not a grind. I got something to work on for the next 90 days. I got something to work on the next 90 days. I got something to work on. And then as I get better and I get better and I get better, it's a motivator. It's a motivator. So the last three weeks when we talk about continuous improvement, the whole discussion will, well, give me one second. The whole discussion will be around how do I keep myself going as a leader? Go ahead. Did you, did you change your question? No. No, just like any other good survey, the, sur the questions are always the same so that you can gauge, right? Now, you might change questions because you don't necessarily like my questions, which is fine, but I would be consistent in the questions, whatever they are, because otherwise you're not going to be able to gauge improvement, not improvement. You may add questions, but I think those three questions are very fundamental. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? Give me some suggestions. Boom, done. That's the one you used for years. Years. Okay. For years. And the reason I used it for years because it was very simple. Just tell me how, what I'm doing. I did change it for a short period of time, and excuse my language on this. I, I, the third question, which is now, if you could send me back to school, what class would you make me take? The third question used to be, what pisses you off about what I do? <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Just what pisses you off, man? I would sit down in roundtable meetings and that would be my opening question to the employees. When I had employee meetings, I would just say, okay, what's pissing you off around here? I'm the big boss. I don't know what happens between me and you. You know, I don't know what happens in the levels of management between me and you, but let's find out right now what pisses you off. What makes you frustrated when you get in your car at home? When you're at your family barbecue and you're telling anybody how bad things suck at your work, what is it? And let's get that handled right now. Yeah. 
Not at first. Because they were probably scared, oh my goodness, if I say this to you now, I'm just going right. to laser in on me that you know, he doesn't like me. Yep. Yeah. And that's why it was important that I did it consistently over a period of time. Because then people started to see that I was authentic and I was sincere and I really wanted their feedback and I was really going to do something with it. Yeah. And that's why it was important to me to do it every 90 days with my direct reports to see when they gave me feedback, they would see me working on it. Not that I would get better necessarily in 90 days, yeah. but they would at least see me working on it and trust was being built. So that then we would, uh, uh, quick, I know we're on a tangent here, but quick anecdotal story. It was a big hotel. I had sent out a memo about how I wanted the operators to answer the phone. So we took thousands of calls a day. And I had said that I, I had gone to a hotel, Four Seasons, and I wanted, I liked the way they answered the phone. And they would say this. You would say, may I have housekeeping? And they would say, my pleasure to connect you. And I was like, oh, that's sweet, dude. My pleasure to connect you. I like that. So as soon as I got back, I sent out a memo. From now on, we are saying my pleasure to connect you. Just a, an edict from on high. We will say it. So memos go out. Literally, eight minutes after the memos all went out. Bring, bring in my office, you know. This is Ian. Ian, this is Maxine up in PBX. That's the operators, right? Oh, hey, Maxine, what's going on? I'm not very happy with this memo you just sent out. Excuse me? <laughs> now, vice president level of an organization, 1,100 employees, and I got some $9 an hour PBX operator calling me and telling me she ain't happy. <laughs> and my first reaction was, excuse me? I do not like this pleasure to connect you. You have not taken into consideration how that will impact our workflow. It's completely out of bound. You know, she went on for like five minutes of all the reasons my pleasure to connect you would not work. <laughs> and at first I was like, uh, you know what? I don't give a rip what you think. You're going to do this. And then it dawned on me. She feels safe enough to call the biggest boss on property and tell him that operationally this ain't going to work. Because you've, her point was, you've already got us saying standard language here. And you've got us saying standard language at the end. And now you added in more standard language. We got thousands of calls to take. All this standard language you're making us do is going to make us inefficient and unable to serve the guests the way you want. Why didn't you ask us? Why didn't you talk to us who are experts in this and get our opinion? And her final point was, you keep saying how important we are. Why do you jam these things down our throat? That was the day I knew we had made it. Because she felt comfortable enough to bring to my attention a mistake. And she wasn't going to go through the boss, 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 boss. She was going straight to the big boss. She felt safe enough to come to the big boss and tell the big boss he was wrong. And I felt like that was huge in the cultural shift of that organization because they were empowered. That's true empowerment. She felt on equal ground with me. She wasn't disrespectful. She was just giving operational reasons why it was a bad decision. Does that make sense? And She's the nine-year-old, absolutely. And we mean that in the greatest respect, right? And, and she's an expert. She had been in that chair for probably 21 years. She had been answering the phone at that hotel probably for at least 20 years. You don't think she forgot more about that job than I knew? She knew exactly how much time she had with the person. And me coming in and just randomly saying, okay, from now on we're saying, my pleasure to connect you. Just because I thought it was really hot. She's like, you're a fool. You're not paying attention. I would suggest to you that over a period of time, as trust is built, you're right. The cynicism fades away. The snarkiness, right? Kind of the eh, 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 jab, jab, jab goes away. And they, people start to believe you're really serious. And they do start to give you very thoughtful feedback. Does that make sense? OK. Anything else in the last three weeks? Because then we got to get on to this three weeks. We got to roll here. Anything else? All right. So the next competency. Before we go into the actual competency, I got to give you a little background. How many would agree with me that in today's day and age, we don't have enough time, energy, or effort to get done everything we need to get done? How many of you agree with that? 
don't have enough time, energy, or effort to get done. I've been sitting in the car, so I'm going to stand up. We don't have enough time, energy, or effort to get done everything we need to get done. And I had that dilemma. I had that dilemma. I felt like there wasn't enough time, energy, or effort to get done everything that I need to get done. In addition to that, every position that I had ever had, I was always beyond myself. In other words, I didn't have the education to be in the job that I was in. I didn't have the knowledge to be the job I was in. I didn't have the pedigree to be in the job that I was in. I didn't have the experience to be the job that I was in. So I was always in positions where I was beyond myself. And everybody knew I was beyond myself, including me. So all of a sudden I'm in a job, everybody knows I shouldn't be in that job, including me. And that's very hard because you know everyone's staring at you. Everybody's sitting in the meeting going, you shouldn't be in this job. But you're still responsible for all these people. And many a day I would go home and I, I literally would cry. I was so overwhelmed. Young 20 some odd old kid and I'm in charge of this whole thing. And I would routinely say that the people that put me in this job made a big mistake. And I've always been a kind of person that when I got in that kind of a mood or that kind of a funk, I would turn to like motivational quotes, right? Maybe it's the athlete in me, you know, motivational quotes or read a little motivational poem and that would pick me up. Well, one day I was looking through this book of quotes and I came to the, a quote of a guy named Archimedes. Archimedes was a mathematician. Archimedes was a uh, inventor. Archimedes was the father of geometry or one of the fathers of geometry. Incredibly old, uh, smart old man from way, way back in the day 2,000 years ago. And his quote was this, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. Give me a place to stand and I will move the world. <clears throat> and I was like, yeah, that's right. A one guy can make it, man. I can do this. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> and then I thought, well, what does he really mean? Give me a place to stand and I will move the world. So I started doing some research on this guy, Archimedes. Who is this guy? Well, here's what I came to find. I came to find that he came up with the concept of buoyancy, right? Of how things float. He was the guy that invented the compound pulley. So that's a, a series of gears and rope that allow a person to pull something or move something that's hundreds upon hundreds of pounds that they can never move on their own, but through the compound pulley, they can move it. And he was the guy that came up with the fulcrum and the lever. Rock on the ground, stick, right? You pull it and you can lift a big, big rock. Anybody ever seen that? The f he was that guy. And as I continued to read that quote, was really him saying this. If I have a lever big enough, if I have a fulcrum big enough, I can move just about anything. So just give me a place to stand. Well, I don't understand, Ian. So what, what did that have to do with you feeling overwhelmed? It dawned on me. What this guy was really saying was, if I have the right tools, I can do just about anything. So just give me a place to stand. And what I thought he was really saying was, with the right system. Well, I still don't follow you, Ian. There are people that feel overwhelmed because they don't have enough time in their week. Is it because they're overwhelmed or they just don't have a good system for managing their time? There are people that feel like they don't know how to motivate another human being. Do they lack the ability to motivate or they just don't have a good system for motivation? There are people that I can never come up with a good idea. Is idea and innovation about somebody sprinkling pixie dust on your head? Or is it more about having a pattern of thinking that would lead you to more innovative ideas? So as I read about Archimedes, I started to realize what he was saying is, I can do anything if I have the right system. He called it a force multiplier. That fulcrum and lever allows me, a man who on my own, and my best day I could probably bench 380. But with a fulcrum and lever, I could move a, a, a rock that's a thousand pounds. I could do three times with the right tool. I started then thinking about this systems approach. And I started to look at other writers. Other writers. Senge, who said that the whole world is a system. What do you mean, Ian? Well, doesn't it, doesn't it amaze you that way up in the sky, millions of kilometers away, there's a ball on fire? And then if it moved 
one inch this way or one inch that way, one centimeter this way, one centimeter that way, it would completely change our world? A system. It's not connected, but it's a system. How about your body? Doesn't it amaze you that you don't have to sit here and go, okay, I need my heart to beat. Okay, let me keep that beating now. Oh, oh I need to move my arm. Let me move my arm up. Or you know what? Let me wiggle my toes because they don't feel... We don't even have to think. It just works. I still don't understand, Ian. What I came to find was that there's systems. There's systems in the workplace. There's systems in the community. There's systems. Archimedes was saying, if I have the right system, I can do just about anything. The 21st century will be ruled by systems thinkers. Do you have a system? Well, what, do you, what is a system? A system is just a deeply set, deeply integrated set of parts that have been put together for a specific purpose. They're the thermostat over there on the wall. When I turn it, it produces a result. But there's also social systems. Like here's an example. Yeah, I am so happy to be having this baby. My mom had me when she was 12, and her mom had her when she was 12, and I'm just happy to be. And you see that cycle play out, right? Or how about this? I don't know, we're just doctors. Our family's always been doctors. My dad was a doctor, his dad was a doctor. We're just doctors. It's a system. Let me ask you guys this. Are we completely satisfied with the condition of the youth across the country? Okay, every head said no. Could it be because we just have a crappy system? Well, you mean the educational system? No, 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 no. See, because it's not just systems, it's thinking big picture. Do we have the educational system the youth serving organizations, the athletic organizations, the arts organizations, the faith organizations, are all of them working together to build the citizen of tomorrow? Yes or no? No. And then we wonder why. How about this, in, in Fort McMurray, when somebody comes from Somalia, do they have a, an effective system for being brought into the community and feeling a part of the community? No. And then we wonder why they're disenfranchised. We wonder why in our largest municipal centers across the country, you have all these people who come from different places that don't feel connected to the community because there's not a good system. Life is just a big system. So the first question is, do you even see that? Or do you think it's just randomly happening? In your organization, systems have either organically grown up and take hold. It sounds something like this. I don't know. It's just what we do around here. Well, why do we do it this way? I don't know. It's just what we do around here. Or systems were designed for a specific purpose at Stat Oil. We're going to build a process. We're going to build a system for a specific purpose. The problem is oftentimes that purpose is no longer relevant. What we built the system for is no longer even necessary. But we keep using the same system, wondering why we don't get the right result. Both tangibly, policies, procedures, their systems. Intangibly, cliques, groups, hatred. Anger, systems get created in our society. Do you even see that? Well, why is that important? Because there's a thousand pound rock in my life. There is no possible way I can lift it. But Archimedes taught me and teaches you, if I have the right system, I can move it. Systems thinking. Now look, a pile of rocks is not a system. A pile of rocks is not, a, if I had a pile of rocks right here, I pulled out a rock, I would still have a pile of rocks. A car engine is a system. Pull out the carburetor, the engine doesn't work. You have systems in your life. The systems you use in your home with your daughter. In your mind, you're saying, am I building the citizen of tomorrow? Yes, I am. What attributes do I want those citizens to have? What qualities do I want them to have? And what am I doing on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis to instill that in my daughter? The challenge is, for all of us that are parents in the room, you not doing that impacts me, you doing that impacts me. You and you raising up your kids. The, the intentionality that you use to raise your kids. Here's what I want them to be like when they're 18, so I'm going to do this today. The more intentional you are, the better your system in your house is better for all of us. Am I right or wrong? Do, would you agree with me that most parents don't think to it to that depth? And that's why we're in the jam that we're in. Systems thinking. So over the next three weeks, I'm going to teach you how to be a systems thinker. Now, you might reject it, and that's fine. 
But if I can get you to be a system thinker, then when you walk around town, you won't just look at one sliver of a problem, drug use. You'll start saying, well, wait a minute, drug use is because of a lack of hope. And a lack of hope is because of this. And now we'll start getting to the root problem. So what Senge would tell you is that we try to solve a sliver of the system instead of the whole system. So the, the next competency is big picture, holistic systems thinking. That we can't just look at slivers anymore. Because when we look at slivers, we never solve the bigger problems. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Systems thinking. Look at what it says in the, the last bubble there. In the 21st century, the shift of systems thinking is talking about moving from parts to the whole, from things to relationships, from structures to processes, from hierarchy to network, from rationale to the intuitive, from what happened to let's make it happen. That's the shift that all of us need to make. And I'll, I'll just dwell on the last one. Most of us are reactive in nature. Most of us are reactive in nature. You got feedback from your daughter, you're now going to react. Eventually though, as we go through this process, we're going to get proactive in nature. Instead, you would be saying, I'm, gonna, I'm, going to make my, I'm going to be a great listener. That's going to be one of my hallmarks. And then you would proactively lay that out. Or we're going to be great at customer service. And then you would build systems to make sure you can deliver great customer service. In your guys' industry, the, the best systems is usually safety. You usually have, most companies have, have built great safety systems. Now, whether anybody follows them or not is another thing. But you usually build great safety systems. My daughter works in the gas and oil industry for a company called Schlumberger. She's a chemical engineer for Schlumberger. They have great safety systems. And they enforce them and they ingrain them because people's lives are at stake, right? Or how about when you get in an airplane, you're walking past the cockpit and you see those pilots going through all their checklists. Checklist, checklist, checklist. Why? Because people's lives are at stake. And no matter how many hours they've flown, they follow that checklist. Well, isn't your daughter's life just as important? And isn't the kids' lives of this community just as important? And aren't the people's lives that you supervise just as important? Aren't our own lives? So shouldn't we have the same kind of level of sophisticated system? Now, over the next three weeks, I am going to give you more information than you can possibly use in a three-week period of time. Because I'm going to give you a lot of systems. Give you a lot of systems. What I want you to do then is just pick out the system that would help you the most right now. Next week, we're going to spend the whole week on time management. We're going to spend a whole week on maximizing the use of your time. Whole week. We're going to talk about delegation. Are you an effective delegator? We're going to talk about motivation. Do you know how to motivate another human being? We're going to talk about how do you come up with a great idea? Do you, can you come up with a great idea? Or is, your, how, is this how you come up with a great idea? Oh, although me sitting like this, should, I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> that wasn't a very good analogy. Right? That was, scratch that from the tape, Tim, please. Yeah. It's on video. The big eye don't lie, man. The big eye don't lie. That's on tape forever. So... Some of us, the only way we come up with a great idea is we just sit there and think and think and think and think and think. So I'm going to throw a lot of systems at you. You're just going to pick out the ones that are most relevant to you. Okay, turn the page. We'll do the survey very, very quickly. And then we got to move. Now remember this survey, Clay, right? Okay, so Clay, what we do, we take this little survey at the beginning to help us understand where we rank in the competency. So the competency proactive systems thinking with a holistic approach, but where do you rank in that? And remember for everybody, the, 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 the survey helps me focus my learning for the next three weeks. I'm going to read them randomly, you just start answering them. I understand there's a symbiotic relationship between human beings. Remember what that means. That means that we're, anybody have a pen for Clay? We got a pen? Keys, keys getting a bunt? Okay. So symbiotic relationship, what does that mean? Hey, that means we're all connected. Even though I don't live in your neighborhood, I don't live in your town, we're all connected. 
And your actions and your words and your deeds do impact me and my actions and my words and my deeds do impact you. I can apply strategies for learning about a group, its key stakeholders and resources. I demonstrate the knowledge of social capital, organizational and community assets, human, financial, environmental. What does that mean? I see resources. I see resources, not just money. I can think outside the box. I can come up with a creative idea. I'm aware of the culture of my organization or my community. I can facilitate the development of teams and establish goals. I understand how to create organizational culture. I can facilitate the development of systems and processes. I have a system, and that says moral development, should say morale, development. I have a system in place for the development of my direct reports. I'm aware of what motivates others. I have a system for effective delegation. And then for those of you that are more community minded, I have a system for the recruitment of volunteers. I have a system for fund development. I can, I can know how to fundraise. When you're done taking a little survey, just look up at me and that way I know you're done. Awesome. So here's the, as you're wrapping up now, here's why it was so impactful to me. The conclusion that I came to of what Archimedes, the great mathematician, was trying to say was pretty simple. Come on in, buddy. The, the, um, what I think, what I think he was trying to say what I think Archimedes was trying to say was pretty simple. You guys are going to make us nervous, so you better find a place to sit down. All right. yeah. <laughs> so there's two beautiful pods right there. And Ross can give you a handout if you'd like. Oh, there you go. They got, either way, you got handouts coming at you from all over the place. They're the same. They're the same. So it's, either way, it's fine. Um, and you two guys introduce yourselves. Tell everybody who you are. Um, I'm Matt Walton. Um, we're both with the Alberta Teacher Leaders Program, which is a, a youth mentoring and sports and recreation program. And we'll be here for the entire summer. Yeah, my name's Taylor. I'm from Ontario. And yeah, with the same deal. Quickly, everybody else introduce themselves. Go. Well, you know Keith. Yeah. Trevor Wolf. Tori. Ross. And we met already, Ian, right? Yeah. And you're jumping in right in the middle, so you're just going to have to roll yeah. with us, okay? <laughs> so this guy, Archimedes, was basically saying this. This is what, what it said to me. He was basically saying, I don't need to be brilliant. I don't need to be, come from the right family. I don't need to have a lot of money in my bank. If I have the, this page right here, fellas. It says choice right at the top. So he was basically saying, all I need is this the right tool or system, and I can do just about anything. And that was very freeing for me. As a guy who didn't belong overseeing 1,100 people, all of a sudden I realized I could lead 1,100 people. And I just needed to go find the right systems. And whether that was a system for performance management, or that was a system for time management, or that was a system for motivation, or whatever the system was, I just needed to go find the right system. And that has served me extremely well as we've done projects all around the world. Like this project in Ghana, you know where Ross is going, everybody knows that Ross is going to Ghana, right? He's going to Ghana on, on the 11th of August through the 27th. He and another 25 or so people from Fort McMurray are going to build a playground. Playgrounds and classrooms and the Anawase School in Ghana, right? It's pretty amazing. It's a long, great, it's not a long, it's a very short story actually, but pretty amazing. Uh, Ian, how are you able to organize a group and send them to Ghana in less than six months, because we got great systems. And those systems have been built over a period of time. I don't know how to do that. I don't need to know how to do that. I just need to be able to deploy a system. So 
if you really want to be highly successful in today's day and age, the first thing you have to re recognize is one, there's not enough time, energy, or effort available to you to get done everything you need to get done. There's just not. The only way you're going to get it done is by utilizing systems that multiply your capacity. A bicycle. Can you run 40 kilometers an hour? Right. But you can ride a bike. See, that mechanical human interface, the mechanical human system, allows you to take what force you have and multiply it. So we got to just find those kind of force multipliers in life. And that's what we'll try to work on in the next three weeks. So whether it's how do I come up with a great idea, whether it's my time and how I utilize it, whether it's motivating another human being, these are all systems based. Now, some of the things that we'll put on the website that we won't talk about today that might only interest a few of you. How do I recruit volunteers? How do I raise money for a nonprofit? How do I communicate powerfully? How do I delegate? So some of you in the room, you don't need to know how to delegate, but others of you in the room, it might be very valuable to you. So next week, I'll start posting some of those videos. There is no possible way that you'll be able to go through those nine hours of videos or whatever it is in three weeks. So don't even try. Just focus on the things that would be most relevant to you personally. And then come back and pick those things up later. How long is the information available to you? So those videos, how long would you have to access those videos? Forever. forever. You get them forever. So you don't have to worry about, oh my God, I can't get to them. Just take your time. Focus on the thing that's most valid and important to you. All right, let's talk about the first system. So the first system is about how do you come up with a creative idea? So somebody tell me right now, how do you come up with a creative idea? What do you do to come up with a creative idea? What do you do? Go ahead. Brainstorming. brainstorming. Here we go. A little brainstorm now. Here we go. Brainstorming. Brainstorming. <laughs> and we all sit in a room, right? That's what we do. We sit in a room. And then you say, okay, guys, we got this problem. Or gals or whatever, we got this problem. And now for the next 20 minutes, I want you to throw out the best of your ideas, right? And then we write them down. We got the white paper or yellow paper or green paper and it's got sticky things on it and we put it up on the wall, right? And then we write them down. Oh, great idea. Oh, that was a great idea, man. Good job. It's role playing. Okay, brother, good job. Good good All right, good job. Well, woo, great idea. Woo, here we go. Woo, woo. Ideas. And then we say this, okay? Idea time is done. Let's organize those ideas. This idea, not so hot. Take it out. And then we start organizing, prioritizing, and then before we know it, we walk out with a plan. Brainstorming. Is that about right? How many have ever done that? Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else got another way that you come up with a great idea? Inspiration. Inspiration. Look to other things. Look to other things. So you step out, you look out at the sun. Yeah. You're like, let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> right? That's exactly what it is. Exactly. You look like one of those kind of guys. So you're like, hey, I say that in love, brother. I say that. And so inspired, or you read something, or you look at an example of somebody who's already doing it, you gain inspiration, you get some creative ideas from what they're doing. If I tweak this, if I tweak that, you borrow. Next thing you know, you got a good idea. Okay? Anybody else? Anything different than the two things we've heard? Research to get others involved. Okay, so you get input from others, you do some research. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Do you routinely come up with innovative and creative ideas? No. You routinely come up with creative and innovative ideas? No. Routinely come up with innovative and creative ideas? Probably not. He wasn't willing to admit as easily as these guys were. He's like, well, wait a minute. I don't know. Maybe I do, man. Maybe I do. Okay, let me tell you. I had the same dilemma. And actually, worse, I never came up with a good idea. Ever. Ever came, never, ever, ever, ever came up with a good idea. Well, wait a minute, Ian. I Googled you. You were nominated Social Innovator of the Year by the Prime Minister. How do you mean you never came up with a good idea? Never came up with a good idea. Because I'm not very creative. And I came to this place where I just said to myself, it can't be that you're born creative. It just can't be. There's got to be more to it than just being born. Like my DNA. You know, I got the lucky DNA and so I'm creative and you're not can't be that. So I started doing research, 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 research. And I came to the workings of Dr. Ludwig out of the University of Texas down in the States. And he basically confirmed what I was saying. He said it wasn't about creativity. It was about your pattern of thinking. 
Have you ever met somebody in your life that just always makes bad decisions? Like, they're always making just, like, they, they're dating the wrong guy or gal. They always in, put money into things that are never going to work. They always get something that breaks. I mean, they just, how many of you know somebody like that? Well, Dr. Ludwig would tell you this. It's not that they're dumb or a bad person. They just have a poor decision-making system. That they ask themselves this question and this question and this question. And when all of us would come to the conclusion of no, somehow they come to the conclusion of yes. That they have a bad pattern or system of thinking. So Dr. Ludwig made the case of this. That creativity is more about the sequence in which you think and ask yourself questions. And less about pixie dust and that you're brilliant. This is the typical business or government planning process. It usually sounds something like this. Whoop. If we had this much money or time or energy, we could do this many things. If we did this many things, then we could have this kind of an outcome. If we had this kind of an outcome, we could have this kind of an impact. Would you agree with me? That's pretty typical. If we had this much time, money, resources, whatever, then we could probably do this stuff, these activities. And if we did these activities, we could probably have this kind of an outcome, and this kind of an outcome would translate to this kind of an impact. That's pretty typical. What's the problem with starting with the premise of, here's what we have? Well, that, do you think, just logically, that would lead you to an innovative idea? And that's why inspiration, looking at others, brainstorming, or even doing research and asking other people, probably won't lead you to a great idea because you're all following this pattern. Starting with what we have. Will starting with what you have get you innovation, yes or no? No. It won't get you innovation. Well, yeah, but you have to be realistic. There's no innovation in realism because <laughs> realism would just lead you to the conclusion it's not going to get any better than it is right now. Was Einstein realistic? Was, was Edison realistic? Was Ford realistic? Was Jobs realistic? No, they weren't. They were looking beyond the realism of the day to what could be. See, I think it's about your pattern of thinking. The following pattern of thinking. Questions. I put on a 3 by 5 card and took to everywhere I went, every meeting I went to for a year. Ironically, and I'm not saying it's because of this, but it could be some validity. Ironically, a year after that year, Let Them Be Kids, our, our charity, was named one of the foremost innovative in the world by the World Leisure Congress. That's a pretty big deal. Now, because I'm brilliant, absolutely not. You're much smarter than me, I guarantee it. It's about your pattern of thinking. I'm firmly convinced of that. So the, the question is, do you have a system to generate a creative idea? This is the pattern that I would use from now on. Step number one, what do I want it to be? From now on, you always start with, what do I want it to be? What does it look like, smell like, feel like, taste like? So whenever you're brainstorming from now on, it's always going to start with, what do we want it to be? And why do I put the caveat on it of smell like, look like, feel like, taste like? Why am I, why am I adding that? Why do I need to be able to explain the outcome in terms of smell like, look like, feel like, taste like. Okay, so you believe it. Why else? Why do I want to be able to explain it in those vivid terms? What's that? Okay, so make it real. But make it real for who? And everyone. i got to be able to explain the outcome because I'm probably going to need other people to help me. The more clear I can be on the outcome, the more likely Keith will buy in. Now, not this three weeks, but the next three weeks, we'll talk about gaining buy-in. But for now, I just got to be able to clearly articulate the outcome. Step number two, where are we at today? Where are we at today? But next to that, write this, courageous conversation. So it's not just, a, a, it's not just sitting around and talking in general terms about where we're at today. It's talking about what really matters. Mandy, right? Mm -hmm. So Mandy, have you ever sat in those brainstorming sessions and everybody's brainstorming on the problem? Brainstorm, brainstorm, brainstorm. And in your mind, you've thought, this is all great, but we're not talking about what's really going on. Off the subject. Yeah. 
So sometimes we're talking about a lot of things, but not what the real problem is. And so we don't come up with a solution to it. So courageous conversation is about this. Having a conversation where we seek to root out the problem, but not blame anybody. Because oftentimes when we have those kind of conversations, we're trying to figure out who to blame. We're going to talk about what really matters, but only in the context of finding whose fault it is so we can attack them. Instead of just talking about what's wrong and how we got here. A courageous conversation talks about only what's important. A courageous conversation does not seek to find blame. A courageous conversation only talks about history, what happened before, in the context of how we can make it better. Not just talk about history to talk about history, but only in the context. So a courageous conversation are rare. Now, let me ask it this way. How many of you would agree with me we probably need to have some courageous conversations in our communities? We do a lot of talking, but not about what the real problems are. We do a lot of talking, but not about what really matters. We do a lot of talking, but we usually do it in the context of who are we going to blame. We're going to blame this party. We're going to blame that party. We're going to blame this elected official. We're going to blame that. Or how about this? Let's just solve the freaking problem. Yeah. <laughs> probably even in your organization, my friend, there needs to be some courageous conversations. In most organizations, we need to have some courageous conversations. Because rarely are we willing to create an environment where we talk about what matters. What's a step that you could take that we've talked about already that would start to create an environment where courageous conversations could happen? Step that you as a leader could take that would start to create an environment where people would feel safe enough to have a courageous conversation. Yes, the survey. That's right, the survey. As soon as they see their boss willing to take feedback and proactively ask their opinion, they'll start to be more willing to have courageous conversations and talk about what really matters. Because we've all sat in the meetings where we all brainstorm. Yeah, we got a great plan. High five. Woo! And you guys are all walking out of the meeting like this. We talked about nothing that mattered. <laughs> right? We've all been in that meeting. And that's why we don't come up with creative ideas. That's why we don't solve things. So step number one, what do I want it to be? Step number two, where are we at today? A real courageous conversation. Step number three, and this is unique. What attitudes would have to be shifted to move us from where we're at to that ideal or that outcome? What attitudes would have to be shifted? Wait a minute, Ian. What do you mean, what attitudes? Would you agree with me that most of the time it's the attitudinal barriers that prevent ideas from happening? So we bring an idea to people and people are like, well, we're not doing that because we've never tried that before. Or we're not doing that because the last three times we tried to do something that sucked and so I don't want to do it. Or we're not doing that because I don't like you personally. And since it's your idea, I'm going to be against anything Keith does. Am I, is this true? Which could be an attitudinal barrier, right? So before I can move from where we're at to what we can become, I better identify the attitudes that have to be shifted to get me from here to there. Well, that doesn't work with money, Ian. What if I'm an entrepreneur and I need money? Well, how about this? If the right seven people in northern Alberta shine favorably on your project, would you have enough money, yes or no? Of course you would. If the right seven governmental people shine favorably on your project, would you have enough money, yes or no? Yes. So is it about money or attitudes? It's about, attitudes. It's about getting those attitudes shifted towards what I want to do. So I think you have to identify those. Then the next step is what activities would I have to do to shift those attitudes to take me where I'm at today to what I could become. And then finally, and lastly, what resources would I need to do the activities to shift the attitudes to where I'm at today to what I could become. That pattern, outcome based first, realistic conversation of today, what attitudes would have to be shifted, what activities to shift the attitudes, and then what money or resources. That pattern. Why is resources last? Because if you want it bad enough, you'll find the resources. And maybe the resources don't have to be money. Maybe the resources are a little bit of time, a little bit of effort. You know the funny thing I've 
seen now and now using that pattern for some 15, 16 years or whatever it's been, it's cheaper. <laughs> it always ends up being cheaper. It always ends up being simpler. It always ends up being easier because I wasn't working off of a resource-based approach. I was working off of an outcome-based approach. Here's what we want it to be. Now let's create a critical path to get there. Trained in, go ahead. Exactly. Perfect. That's, you said it better than I could have. We, we limit ourselves from moment one because we limit ourselves based on what we have. When we cast the vision, it's funny how we'll figure out how to get there. And it's always cheaper in my experience. It's always been cheaper. So here's what I would encourage you to do. Well, first of all, let me ask you this. How many days, you should have known this by now, how many weeks does it take for me to establish a new behavior? 21 to 28 days. That's why this is a 21-day program, right? 21, 21, 21. I would challenge you, take this pattern, put it on a 3 by 5 card, just start taking with you. Yeah, but what would I do in the meeting? I don't understand how I'd use this. It'd be sound just something like this. Meeting starts. Hey, I got a question. What's that, Ian? Well, what exactly is it we're trying to accomplish? I just want to be very clear. What's the outcome? Somebody explains it. Oh, okay, thanks. Then we continue to talk. So where are we at right now? Like, I mean, really, I mean, let's really have a frank conversation. Where are things really at right now? People say it. Oh, okay. Well, I, I know we're trying to brainstorm, but there's probably some attitudes that got us here, and there are probably some attitudes that we'll have to overcome to get us out of here. What are some of those attitudes? Everybody says them. Hmm. Well, I wonder what we could do to shift those attitudes. Like, what kind of activities we could do? Everybody answers. And then you just say, huh, how much do you think that would cost? That's the simplicity of getting the group to clarify and solidify. So you still do your brainstorming, but you're going to focus it in such a way that we're more likely to come out. You might still sit around and try to get some inspiration, but you're going to focus that energy in a way that doesn't limit you from moment one, as she said. Same with the research or talking with others. So do all the great ideas have to come out of your head, yes or no? So, so whether you get more creative by changing your pattern, or you can just facilitate that in a group dialogue, either way, fine. Well, Ian, you know, I don't particularly like your little pattern. That's fine. I don't care. You can go to the internet tonight. Go to the University of Google tonight and type in critical thinking skills. Or you can type in creative thinking skills. And you'll get 495,000 articles in 1.29 seconds that will tell you different people's theories on a pattern to utilize. All I'm saying is get one. <laughs> get one. You need to be a creative thinker. You need to be able to come up with a great idea. How many of you ever worked for a boss that never had a good idea? Yeah, none of you from CP Services raise your hand. <laughs> and here's what happens. Here's what happens. This is really important. When we talk about organizational culture, when we start working with people that don't ever have a great idea, we start doubting the organization. It's even worse. How many have ever worked for a boss that had routinely bad ideas? We really start doubting the organization. So we don't just doubt them as a leader, we start doubting the organization. And we won't give our time, talent, and treasure and our best to a boss that continually comes up with bad ideas. And not having any ideas is all is just as bad as bad ideas. So in today's day and age, if you want people to follow you, you better be able to come up with a good idea. And whether it's because you can come up with a good idea or you can facilitate a good idea, you better be able to come up with a good idea. Get it in your toolkit, a system, just like the fulcrum and lever. I don't have to be the brightest guy in the world. I just got to be able to come up with a system that will generate more likely than not a good idea. Does that make sense? All right, now, on the website, we'll talk about this more. There'll be a video that you can come back and watch and it'll download it more. Next page. Okay, next week, oh, side note before I go into next week. This, this color, this colory, colory, colory page, motivation. So we're going to talk about motivation. There'll be a, there'll be a, um, 
there'll be a video that will explain that page. It'll be another system. But just really quickly, let me give you some keys to this. Motivation is the most over-discussed, misunderstood part of management that there is today. And most of you think that motivation is about somebody being able to be a good talker. Well, Ian, you're pretty motivating. You're a good talker. You can tell a good story. You get me fired up. Oh, whenever you're around, you're energy. You have great energy. No, that's just what I ate last night. That smell. That <laughs> greenhouse gas is coming from. So I would suggest to you that it's not... Motivation today is no longer about giving a good pep talk. I don't think it's about being able to give a good speech. I think people are rejecting that. The pep, pep, rah, rah doesn't, how far will pep, pep, rah, rah go with your people? Not over a period of time. Yeah, it won't, over a period of time, month after month, year after year, if the boss comes in and tries to give that pep, pep, rah, rah, that doesn't go very far. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That pep, pep, rah, rah goes away fast. So motivation is something else. I think motivation is just simply that which moves me into action. So do you have a system to move another human being into action? Like if this was a, if this was a stove and I put my hand on the stove and I touched it, ow, I would be motivated, right? That which moves me into action. And you have used different motivational techniques because there's only a couple of them. One is the boss method of motivation. Shut your mouth, do what I say, I'm the boss, that's enough. Boss method of motivation. Some of you have used the tricky approach to motivation. Hey, look, you better do this or when your dad comes home, there's going to be problems. Well, the dad, bye-bye, see you later. The... The dad doesn't know anything about it, but you're using the power and the authority and the threat of the dad to get somebody to move into action. Or we've done that with bosses, right? We use the boss's name to get our coworkers to get something done. Well, you know what? The boss is coming by. We better get this thing done. That's the tricky approach to motivation. Or there's the tangible approach to motivation. Hey, if you do this, I'll give you five bucks. Hey, if you do this, I'll give you five bucks. Hey, if you do this, I'll give you five bucks. And what's she going to ask tomorrow? Ten. For 10. The tricky approach to motivation won't work, and the tangible approach to motivation doesn't work. Or how many of you know this approach to motivation? Hey, Keith, how you doing, man? Good to see you. How's the wife? How's the kids? Good to see you. Hey, can you do me a favor? <laughs> Next day, Keith, what's up? How you doing, buddy? My man, <laughs> can you help me out a little bit? The third day, he sees me and what does he do? Ian, crap. <laughs> That's the good old boy approach to motivation. I'll get you to move into action just because you think I'm a good guy or a good gal. All four of those techniques you've all used. The un unfortunate part of it all is they won't sustain. Motivation today is not a pep talk and it's not any one of those four things. If I want to move this young man into action, then I'll better understand his dreams, his hopes, his wants, and his desires. I'll then try to help him create a critical path to those dreams, hopes, wants, and desires. And then I'll support him in that path. When he stumbles, I'll give him advice and suggestions and coaching. When he succeeds, I'll celebrate his achievement. That will motivate him. And as I build a trusting relationship with him, he'll allow me to speak into his life. And as, I, as he allows me to speak into his life, I'll have more and more influence with him. So all of a sudden, it's not about being a good talker. It's about being a good... Right. All of us in the room can be motivators today. We can be great motivators. If we're willing to listen to another human being's dreams, wants, and desires, show them the assets that they have, help them create a critical path to get to that, and then support them on the critical path. Because what are we teaching? The only true motivation that will last. Self-motivation. If you're, how many employees are in CP services? 120. If, if, of the, if 120 people became 5% more self-motivated tomorrow, would you increase the profitability of your organization? Probably more than 5% yeah. too, right? So for me as a leader, I'm not trying to get you 100% self-motivated. 
That's unrealistic. I just need you to be 5% more self-motivated than you were the day before. The 30 young people that you're working with, the 50 young people, you just need to get them 5% more self-motivated. So how are we going to do that? Stay tuned, watch the video. Watch, I want you to watch that thing about the system and that flow chart that you see. Why is it in a flow chart? The reason it's in a flow chart is so you can learn the steps. Yeah, but I'm already a great motivator. I'm already great at getting people in action. Awesome. Can you teach that to someone else? So if you're a mid-level leader in the room, it's not enough for you to know how to do it. You got to be able to teach it to someone else. Because if only you know how to do it, then your excellence stops with you. And it's only going to be excellent when you're involved. But if you can replicate yourself, create little mini me's, right? Then if I, if I can replicate myself in you, now I got a chance to actually grow the organization and make it more impactful. So you as the biggest boss, both in stature and authority, right? You as the, the head cheese, are you're not judged on your performance. You're judged on the 120th guy the furthest away from you which means you got to be able to teach this stuff because it's the supervisors and foremen who are the key to your leadership success, not you. You might be the greatest leader of all time, but if you can't teach it, then you're not going to have any great leaders down the line. Does that make sense? And that, that should be for all of us, a community. You can have the greatest mayor of all time, but if that mayor can't grow up other leaders in the community, the community will be limited to the ability of that person. How many have ever seen a community that there was a great mayor, but after they left, everything went to crap? That's because they never grew up other leaders. So, is this one yours? Yeah. So, I want you to go and I want you to learn. Even if you feel like you're a good motivator, be able to learn the steps of motivation. It's the most misunderstood, over-discussed aspect of leadership. You got to have a system. Okay, the final system. The final system. <sighs> Patterns of thinking and this next system, I think, are the two most critical systems you can have in your toolkit. So much so that next week, we're going to spend a whole week on the system. On Monday morning, you're going to get an email. That email is going to have about a half hour video in it. Don't try to watch it all in one day. You're all too busy to do that. Take 15 minutes Monday and Tuesday. Watch half of it on Monday. Watch half of it on Tuesday. It's really, really good. And not just because I did it. It is really, really good. Because it boils down the basic fundamentals of maximizing the use of your time. Time. And then on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, there'll be three more emails that'll reinforce the concept. At the end of the week, I'll give you an exercise for the following week. I'm going to have you track your time. Where does my time go currently? It's called the time matrix exercise. Why, and Why such a two-week emphasis on time? I already said, and you all agreed, there's not enough time to get done everything you need to get done. How many of you agree with that? You know what the problem with that is? Kids don't get raised. Or if the kids get raised, you're not healthy because you don't get enough sleep. And if you're getting enough sleep, then you're probably neglecting your spouse. And if you're not neglecting your spouse, then you're probably neglecting your work. And how many of you ever felt the pressure that you know have something that you're neglecting in life? And that's because we have a disease, a, a pandemic in society. People don't know how to maximize the use of their time. Oh, so what you're talking about is time management, right? We're gonna, time management, we're going to have a schedule and a to-do list. and a, uh, Yeah, okay, time management, this will be great. No, I'm not talking about time management. There's a big difference between time management and maximizing the use of your time. What do you think the difference is? Time management, maximizing the use of your time. Well, you can have everything on a schedule, but do you follow it? Okay, that's an excellent point. What else do you think? What do you think the difference is between time management and maximizing the use of your time? Efficiency and, Efficiency and effectiveness. Here's the funny thing about time. I'm going, to use, I'm going to use this analogy, and it'll be the backdrop of our whole discussion around time. What, what's your name, big fella? Mac. A, a, what is it? Mac. Mac. And where are you from? Sundry, Alberta. Really? Yeah. 
<laughs> Sundry, right out to, just north of Toronto. No, Alberta. Oh, Alberta. Northwest oh. Northwest of Calgary. Oh, you said you're from Ontario. Yeah. And where are you from? Kingston, Ontario. Oh, Kingston. Yeah. Oh, very nice. The head of RMWB is from Kingston. Yeah. Guy named Glenn is from Kingston. Very nice community. Okay, so, Mac, mm -hmm. how old are you? 22. 22. You have a very loud voice, Mac. I just do. so you know, you have to do. <laughs> it's like you're very loud. You project very, very well. I'm are a you teacher. a coach? I, I just graduated from education. Oh, you did. Today. You're going to be a good teacher. Yes. Very nice. Um, Mac, can you and I play a game? Sure. At this point, Mac is like, leave me the hell alone. No. <laughs> First of all, I'm sitting in this goofy pod. I'm like six foot nine, <laughs> sitting in this goofy pod. I'm sitting where in a fishbowl that everybody can stare at me, and now you're picking on me. I don't like you very much, chubby brown man. Anyway, so Mac, yes. I'm going to take $86,000, and I'm going to put it in your bank account. All right. All of a sudden, he likes the bald man. Yes. Mac, there'll be two stipulations to the $86,000. Stipulation number one, Mac, is I'll put it in there at the beginning of a day, the beginning of the day. Stipulation number two, at the end of the day, I'm going to come back just before midnight. Anything left in the bank account, in the positive balance, I will take away. Now, you could take that money and give it to charity. You could take that money and spend it on yourself. You could take that money and give it to family. You could take that money and do whatever the hell you want with it. I don't care. I just know this. I'm coming back at 1159.959, and I'm going to take away anything you left. Tomorrow, Mac, you might, might get another $86,000 but you don't know that for a fact. The only fact you know is I'll give you $86,000 at the beginning of the day, and at the end of the day, anything left in the positive balance, I will take away from you. Mac, what would you do with that money? I'd move it into a, a different account so you couldn't access it. Okay. You would do something with that money? Yes. Would you leave a dime in the account? Depends. Would you leave a dime Depends in the account? Money you need. Help him. Would you <laughs> leave a dime in the account? <laughs> Mac, the teacher. <laughs> Listen I to us. The yes, move the money. <laughs> now, here's the funny thing, Mac. You, along with everybody else in the room, you get $86,000 every day. How many of you know what it is? Yes? 86,400 seconds in a day. See, there's 86,400 seconds in a day, and they're given to you as a gift to spend however you want. It's the one thing that winners and losers have in common. Time, 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes to an hour, 24 hours in a day, and 168 hours in a week. The reason that I think, and I think it's important, the reason I think it's important to spend two weeks on time is it's a perishable commodity. Mac, at the end of tonight, any of those 86,400 seconds you haven't used wisely, haven't used to better yourself, your neighbor, your community, your business, your whatever, what happens to those 86,400 seconds? They're gone. They're gone, right? You get them back? Maybe someday. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want you cheating my children. Yeah. Let's go in the middle, in the pod. In the pod. In today's continuum, yeah. do you get them back? No. Thank you, Einstein. I appreciate it. <laughs> so here's the thing. Yeah, physics teacher, that's right. Math, uh, math very good. So, so here's the challenge that all of us face. Time. The first thing you need to know about time is a perishable commodity. So when you call my office and you say to my staff, I'd like to talk to Mr. Hill, here's what they're going to say. What's the point? Why do you want to talk to Mr. Hill? What do you hope to accomplish by talking to Mr. Hill? No, they're not going to say, it. my pleasure to connect you. They're going to say to you, what's the desired outcome? Anytime Ross calls me and says, we want to do this new thing, what's the first thing I say to you? Why? What's the outcome? What's the point? Because I know I only have 168 hours this week. And I know I only have, today, 86,000 seconds. I can't be wasting them. I can't be wasting them. The next thing we have to realize about time is we all get the same. It's how I utilize my time. Money. Taking the money analogy, do I want to manage my money? Do I want to put it in the bank at 1% or whatever? Or do I want to take it and invest it in things that will give me a greater return? That when I put $5 in, I get $50 back. 
Or I put $5 in, I get $20 back. I put $500 in, I get $1,000 back. Which one would you want with your money? 1% interest or I put in five, I get 10. Which one? This one? Yeah, don't ask back. I want this one. Listen now, this is really important. Most of us manage our time. What we don't do is invest our time to give us the greatest return. We don't take an hour of time and try to get five hours back. An hour of time and try to get 10 hours back. So the, the individual who creates the system to maximize the utilization of their time understands that certain activities give us greater return and other activities give us lower return. There was actually a philosopher that came up with that principle, Pareto. Pareto's principle said this, that 80% of the activities return, I'm sorry, 20% of the activities return 20% of the result, or 80% of the results to review. Pareto said that 20% of the activity gave you 80% of the results. He called them high leverage activities. I call them high return on investment activities. Let me borrow your pen real quick because I don't have a whiteboard here, so let me borrow your pen. Here's what it looks like visually. You have some activities, right? Some activities that give you a greater return for your time invested. Then there's other activities that give you less of a return. Like an example would be email. How many of you start the day just answering emails? And as they come in, you answer them. Email comes in, you answer. Email comes in, you answer. Email comes in, you answer. And you work your ass off the whole day, and then you get to the end of the day, and what do you say? I didn't get shit done today. I didn't get anything done today. Because you bought into the addiction of urgency. Phone rings. Pick it up. Why not just let it go to voicemail? Do you really need to answer it right now? Is that the most important thing you could be doing with your time? See, there are some activities that give you a greater return, some activities that give you less of a return. In your life, in your life, in your life, in my life, we all have roles in our lives. Dad, husband, employer, worker, myself, my faith, my community organization I'm a part of, and so on. We all have roles. In those roles, I only have about 100 to 110 hours to use. Well, wait a minute, you said there's 168 hours in a week. 42 hours goes to sleeping. Even if I just sleep six hours a night times seven, 42 hours just went to sleeping. Then if you take out eating and driving, in a, even in a rural community, you can figure you got about 100 to 110 usable hours. Now some of us, we just cut back our sleep, we work while we eat, we work while we drive, but ultimately you only have 168 and you're not using all of them. So I would suggest to you, you probably only have max 110 usable hours. And somehow I have to allocate 110 usable hours into all these roles I play in my life. And we wonder why you feel like you're overwhelmed. Does this start to make sense? So wouldn't it be in my best interest to figure out those activities that when I put in an hour, it's like putting in five? Or those activities that when I put in an hour, it's like putting in 20? It sucks hours out of me actually, like email and things like that. System. Do you have a system to maximize the utilization of your time? This is going to sound harsh, but I said it a moment ago. You'd be hard pressed to have, be a good dad in today's day and age if you don't have a way to maximize the utilization of your time because someone's going to get shortchanged. One of those roles is going to get shortchanged. Unless, of course, you can maximize the utilization of your time. An example. I'm not sure what you mean, Ian. Okay, an example. My wife. My wife is a phenomenal woman in her own right. She's been woman of achievement, woman of the year a number of times. She danced all over the world. She was a lead in a North American wide McDonald's commercial when she was 14. This is a superstar woman, right? And she does a lot of projects. So how do I fulfill my role as husband? What's the high investment activity that when I put in an hour, it'd be like 10. You know what it is? Take her to a show. And not just a movie. I gotta take her to like, like a play or a musical. If I take my wife to a play or a musical, that three hours is like getting 15 hours of sitting on the couch watching DVD or watching Netflix or whatever. We're gonna have a nice night, honey. We'll watch a movie. And she's like, yeah, that's great. Mm. 
you smell, I gotta lay next to you on the couch. But if I pick her up, take her to dinner, and it doesn't matter even if it's just community theater, she's in, man, because she's a former you know, performer. She's into it, she loves it, it's great, it recharges her, she's energized. I just bought myself 90 days, man, how many of you know what I'm talking about right now? 90 days of her off my back, 90 days of not complaining, 90 days of no honey-do list, 90 days. High return on investment activity. I fulfill my role of good husband when I take her and do those kind of things. Now, it took me about 10 years to learn that. I'm trying all kinds of other stuff. That's a high return on investment activity. I put in three hours, I get like 15 hours back. So start thinking in your life, what are the high return on investment activity with your kid? When you do that one thing with your kid, it's like doing 20 hours of something else with your kid. And then here's the thing we're gonna learn. We're gonna learn how to identify those high return on investment activities, and we're gonna learn how to do what you said. Have the discipline to organize my week to make sure that I have those high return on investment activities. We call it time blocking, and we call it making an appointment with myself. You won't blow off an appointment with somebody in the room, but you blow off appointments with yourself every day. You start your day and you say this, I am going to do this before the day is done, at the end of the day. Crap, I can't believe I didn't do that. <laughs> Because, weeks. right, some of you are stuck with a to-do list. You set yourself up for failure every day. You make this extensive to-do list, and then the day blows up, and at the end of the day, you look at the to-do list, and you say, I'm such a loser, man. I didn't get all that done. And then the next day, the same thing happens. Next thing, we're going to talk to you about how do you do a week list. Here's what I need to get done this week, because it's unrealistic to do it in one day. We're gonna teach you how to feng shui your life. You know what feng shui is? It's the whole concept of the flow of energy. Some of you, bosses in the room, you have a meeting Monday morning at 8 a.m. Bosses have meetings Monday morning at 8 a.m. That's the dumbest thing you ever heard in your life. Because Monday morning at 8 a.m., what is there always gonna be? Crisis, problems, issues, challenges, especially for the boss. Everyone always wanna talk to the boss. Never have a meeting any day of the week at 8 a.m. If you're a boss that people need your attention. Because every morning at 8 a.m., they're going to need your attention. So somebody's going to lose, either the people that need your attention or the people who are supposed to be in the meeting with you. Sorry, I can't start the meeting right now. i got to go take over a problem. And it's every day like that. And you want to say to the boss, <laughs> boss, stop scheduling things at this time. Flow with the energy of the day. Leave that time available to just go do the meeting and schedule this meeting with us at 10 o'clock when everything settles down. How many say that makes sense? But would you agree with me? We try to flow against the energy of our lives all the time. Maximizing the utilization of your time is about a lot more than just a to-do list and a calendar. Finally, there are some tools that you have to have. Now, whether that tool is an iPhone or that tool is a day planner, there are some tools that you have to have to maximize the utilization of your time, and we'll talk about that as well. So, starting next week, starting on Monday, we'll begin to introduce a system of how to maximize the utilization of your time. Do I have a system where I have long-term goals and I can connect daily activity to the long-term goal? And that more days than not, more weeks than not, my activities are in alignment with where I want to go long-term in each one of the roles that I play in my life. If I have that, I have a system to maximize the utilization of my time. Anything short of that, I'm probably wasting my time. And I'm probably not satisfied with the results that I'm getting. So much of the satisfaction of the results that I get out of life have to do with my ability to use my time wisely. Because here's the one thing, Keith. It's going away. It'll be gone. Midnight tonight, man. It's done. It's over. See you later. No more time. Okay, so those are some of the systems. Now, obviously, we couldn't go in depth into them today. That's the whole point of the three weeks. Monday morning, you're going to get an email. That email will have a half-hour video to talk about time. But what else is it going to have in it? Well, you got to answer your questions. you got to make your commitment, right? you got to make your commitment. I don't want to do it online, Ian. Okay. Well, then I gave you a little form right here. You could fill out the form, scan it in, and email it to me. That's fine. Because this form is exactly like, exactly like, the commitment. So you can either fill it out here, you can go to that link, or you can click the link in your email on Monday morning.
Okay? Next week is about time. And then the following week, we'll talk about some other things. But be looking starting next week on the website. There'll be a, a link for delegation. Like some of you leaders in the room, maybe you want to talk about delegation. Click that link. Watch the 20-minute video. Look at the handout for a system for better delegation. Look at that system for motivation. It'll be up there next week. Effective communication. It's about a one-hour training on communication. A system for communication. All that information is there. But there will be more information than you could possibly take in in the three-week period. So just pick out the pieces that are most relevant to you currently. Because you have access to, to this information forever, you don't have to worry about getting behind. All right, we started a little bit late, so we're ending a little bit late, but let's go ahead and wrap up. Somebody tell me something you're taking away from today. Somebody tell me something you're taking away from today. Come on now. What does that mean? When you, before you came in here, and now you're leaving, what do you mean just system? What do you mean? What did you take away? And for your job, as I understand it, because you're working with different crews, you're all about systems and, sim and systems implementation. Now, someone that work in the patch or whatever might say, well, what's the difference between a system and a process? Processes or, or multiple, go ahead, multiple processes make up a system, right? That's that carburetor car engine thought. So you have processes that individuals do or groups do, and those processes encompass a system. Make sense? Somebody else, something you're taking away. Yes, Manny. The higher return of investment. I always thought it makes sense what you're saying because you do something or you do something nice for somebody, like you say, like take your wife to show. And initially you're like, oh my goodness, this is going to take like hours. This is horrible. Like whether it's making dinner, like a nice dinner, or like. Oh. Right. Yeah, and, and if we can think of it on a personal level, as we transition it into the workplace, what are those activities that actually get me more time? Yeah. Like an example would be for a general manager, spending time with employees is a high return on investment activity, right? <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm listening to them, I'm getting feedback from them, and yet it's the thing that we do the least, right? We do it because the, there's so much other stuff to do, right? In the field, baby. In the field. It is absolutely in the field. Because the funny thing about in the field, and when we talk about this high leverage activity stuff, it kills multiple birds with one stone. In the field, you can check quality work. In the field, you can check safety. In the field, you can check operational efficiency. In the field, you can talk to employees and generate new ideas and creative ideas and better ideas. You can build trusting relationships. You can talk to clients and vendors. and that. You can get all that done by being in the field. So that hour in the field actually returns you five, six, eight, ten hours. I would, li I, when my, my five square miles is probably pales in comparison to the distance that your organization covers. But that five square miles of property and things that we owned that I would routinely go to, I found that when I could traverse that five square miles in a month, little bit, little bit, little bit, or an hour here, an hour here, an hour here. I would traverse that five square miles in a month or in maybe a month and a half. I would spend good time in each one of those areas, including graveyard. Once a month, I worked night shift. Once a month, I had my secretary schedule night shift. So that meant 12 times a year, I was on the night shift. I came in at 11, went home at 6 a.m., 12 times a year. Why? Because I got a third of my employees working at night. <laughs> I mean, I'd go in and clean the grease with them. I'd scrub the floors with them. I'd hang out. Just, hey, boys, what's up? What's up, fellas? Ladies? Why? Because I knew all I needed, all they needed was a, one, month of, one, hour, one night of my time a month. They didn't want to see me any other time. But they, what did they know? They knew they could talk to me. 
They didn't need to go to the union. They knew they could talk to me. They needed to talk to shop steward. They knew they could talk to me. They didn't have to get all grumbly and threaten to walk out because they knew once a month they'd see me. That solved so many problems, just access. All right, somebody else, something you're taking away from today as we wrap up. Something you're taking away from today. Anybody else? How about you two young guys? What's your story? You were only here for half of it. Tell, tell me something, Mac, you're taking away. Um, a different way to look at time. Hmm. 86,000 bucks, man. That's all you got. That's all you got. 86,000 bucks. And so you better use it wisely. And you know what? It's funny. When you start thinking in those terms, you start reevaluating the things you actually do. Because are they going to return any investment whatsoever? Or are they just a meaningless activity that has no purpose? Well, you're saying you never relax? Oh, yeah. Relaxing, it can be a meaningful activity that returns you significant. There's some people that work too much. They don't block any enough time to get rested and recharged and re-energized, right? Okay. So Monday morning, email, we'll start talking about time, pick out your one thing and turn it in, and then we'll see you. Yes? Can we hand you this? No. You don't hand those in, they're for you. Right? Self-evaluation for you to organize yourself on what you're going to focus on for the next three weeks. Right. All right, guys, let's get out of here. Thank you for your time.